YouTube. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's literally the day for a lot of people. There'll be much mistletoeing and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Hello to everybody out there. Uh, yeah, Jeff just said this is the day this releases is Christmas Day. And you know what my hope is? For it's those up. of you out there who celebrate this holiday, when you get to about like two, three o'clock in the afternoon and you're sick and tired of all your relatives, Jeff and I can provide just a little bit of escape for you for the next couple of hours. Exactly. In fact, I want to take a second and say hi to you, the person at their in-law's house sitting on the toilet <laughs> with the phone and a headset right now. <laughs> I see you. It's cool. I mean, I'm not watching. I'm not watching you, but I see right, you. I know. Right. And uh, to everyone else out there who doesn't celebrate this holiday, happy Monday. Because yeah. you guys are awesome too. And we hope we can provide some distraction for you today as well. Uh, Jeff, I, little preview. I have not been this excited about an episode since like the end of the Vorlon Shadow War. I don't think I've been so, uh, I don't know what the word is, miffed, upset, uh, cheated, whatever, about your prediction uh, about an episode as uh, coming into this one. Miffed, upset, I mean, and cheated, huh? I mean, <laughs> there's some pretty darn specific things there's, you uh, you pulled dude, out. <laughs> there is, I was, I was, well, I don't think one was a prediction. I think one, I was just talking. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, the, the one I'm thinking of, I think, yeah, I, it, like there's, there's one where it's just going and I'm like, like I'm watching it and I'm, I'm, my face goes, wait, uh, this is just what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, which frankly, and, and we'll get there later, but, uh, you know what I really have come to believe with stuff like this is this isn't that Brent is some masterful genius when it comes to this although i will take every bit of credit for that as you should um i think it's that jms is such a masterful writer that he has planted all of this stuff that it's just obvious at this point mm -hmm. like that he has you thinking about certain things at certain times that when this stuff comes up you're like well of course absolutely that's what that is yeah. um so I, I, you know, and I can't exactly put my fingers on it, but that's, that's what I'm guessing really, really is going on. Uh, for those of you who think that shenanigans have been had, I promise you hand on a Bible. They have not, they have not. Well, let's get into it. Let's, into let's into do it. this. I'm all for it. Let's yeah, go. Let's oh, it. well, you guys out there are about to see Jeff and I recording an audio podcast. You guys are getting the behind the scenes. This is all the outtakes. The flubs. We don't edit this one. You guys get it as it happens, raw and in the flesh. Jeff, hit that magical button, my friend. You are valued and you are needed. You will be emperor. I think you're about to go where everyone has gone before. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast Babylon 5 for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time, not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And I'm Brent Allen, and I am the one who will be. And we're watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you. The one who is. That's right. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters who have decided to try our hand at this new show. Well, new to us, Babylon 5. And we're taking those skills we've learned as Star Trek podcasters where we look for deep moral messages. And we're applying those skills here to Babylon 5, looking for those deep moral messages. But we are also looking for how these messages are being told to us in a uniquely Babylon 5 way. While this is not a podcast about Star Trek, we are sure to make some of those references. So to keep us honest and on task, we play the rule of three. And that means each one of us gets up to and no more than three references to Star Trek per episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, a refund. I'm pretty excited for this little section here because everything's going to be a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a mix up from normal. All right. 
but I'm going to start in a very comfortable place. Brent, we have a five-star review. Oh, yes. From Apple Podcasts, MG169 says, a lot of fun. Nice. It's so much fun to relive the joy of watching Babylon 5 for the first time with these two. Even if you don't always agree with their assessment of the individual episodes, it's always fun to play along when they guess what's going to happen. The hard part is to hold back on spoilers when commenting, but watching them figure out things for themselves makes it all worthwhile. You know, Jeff, something I don't think you and I acknowledge nearly enough is just how hard it must be for our listeners out there to respect the no spoiler rule and to really walk that line. So I, let me say, cause I don't think we've said it in a long time to those of you who are trying your hardest not to spoil and keep the show as, as uh fresh for Jeff and I to keep the integrity of the show together. Thank you so much. Cause I, I know you're, you're sitting there squirming in your seats and laughing along with us. Even, even when it's not a prediction, it's just sort of something we say offhand. I think so much about Valen and Anna and all those things. And people kept their mouths shut for so long. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. That was so cool. You, Jeff, you hit those two things. I like, I didn't see either one of those coming. In fact, you said both of those, and I was like, no, that's dumb. And sure enough, that's where we went. Not so dumb, right? Mm. Well, hey, Brent, here's where we get fun. We have another five-star review. Oh, yes. From Audible. Oh, I, Audible. I went back to Audible. What's up, Audible? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make that more of a habit at some point. I'm going to get can, better here, at I can it. help with that. You ready? Right. For everyone out there. Alexa. Play Babylon 5 for the first time. Well, hey, this one's from James B. James B says, great show, guys. Absolutely love listening to both of you and seeing things through your eyes. Love that Brent is a Stargate fan and brings some of that to the table. Love that Jeff rocks the Mass Effect series. This is my first podcast that I have ever listened to, and you guys have set the bar pretty high for entertaining content as I've tried listening to other podcasts, and I did not like them. Mm. Anywho, this is me finally giving you a five-star review. Wow. Thank you so much. And you know what? Different podcasts for different folks out there. You know? Exactly. And uh, we're, we're happy to be your chosen one. And uh, Jeff, if I do say so myself, I like our show. I like our show too. You know, be and, and and it's that rule that that's it's that rule I often talk about. When you go to make a podcast, make the show that you would want to listen to. Figure out what you want in a show and then make that show. So this show is exactly how I would want a Babylon 5 show to be. We just have to be making it. I always love those times when I'm editing and I catch a clip that either cracks me up or kind of blows my mind and I'll, I'll clip it and send it to you. And I'm just like, wow, this is so cool. I can't wait for people to hear this. Right, right. So much fun. So much fun. Well, Jeff, you know, along with our rule of three, there is uh, other games. There are other games that we like to play here at Babylon 5 for the first time. One of those games comes at the end of the episode where we try to predict what next week's episode is going to be about based on title alone. Never having seen it, never jumping ahead because we don't do that. Uh, we don't look at thumbnails. We don't look at show descriptions that are never accurate anyway. We don't check out IMDb. None of that sort of stuff. This is the spot where we try to look back last week and see what we said this week was going to be about. Jeff, what did you say moments of transition was going to be and how close were you? Not nearly as close as you are. Actually, you know what? I think we both did a pretty great job on this one in different ways. I, oh, don't I forget, said that we're we, scoring each other. Oh, that's right. That's right. Scores. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I said that the Minbari war was going to wrap up in this episode. Right. And that Naroon was going to be the reason why, but I thought what he was going to do was the chrysalis thing. I thought uh -huh. he was going to go half and half, but I also called that he was going to either hybrid as religious cast and warrior cast or go one way, but try uh, where I missed it, the, the whole sense was the chrysalis thing, obviously. And uh, I also thought that he was going to uh, demolish the caste system. Jeff, I'm going to give you like nine tenths of a point on that one. Wow. We're only scaling on one on one to zero to one. Like that's like nine tenths of a point, Jeff. You were so close, so close. 
So, well, hey, yeah. Why don't you why don't you hit us with yours? Well, mine. I said that the Mimbari Civil War was going to heat up. I didn't think it was going to come to an end. Although I'm really glad it did because it it felt so good. Um, but I did say that I thought Narun and Delenn were going to try to work together to reform the Great Council. But somehow Narun was going to weasel his way in to take control of the council and seize control of the Mimbari government. Wasn't so close on that. However. In another conversation, other in the, in the 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 show last week, we we started talking about the idea that nothing good happens when the the religious leaders or the military leaders of a society take over. That it's the workers who like when when the workers are in charge when the Roman uh, Empire was controlled by the Senate, not by Caesar, things were good. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in recent history, we can all think of some other countries that when you're controlled really by the people and not by religious or military, by one faction over the other, uh, and that those two factions are meant to serve the greater, that literally was how this episode ended. And I was shocked. And and we were just saying right before we came on the show, and I, I'll reiterate, I, I one, I promise you, I did not watch ahead. This, this was not anything I did. I, I think, I suspect this has very little to do with Brent and way more to do with what JMS does with how he seeds his show in his writing that leads you to already have these thoughts before he ever actually gives them to you. So that yeah, I think the absence of the worker cast being mentioned is what like put them in our head. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. he, he, he drops these things that already has you on that train that when he presents this, this solution to you, you're like, well, of course that's what it is. That's what I think. I'm going to give you 0.8 of a point on that one. Really. It's that last piece coming in to save. Cause that last piece, I mean, I mean, you almost even like named the, the, the new makeup of the gray council and everything, but you know what? Really? I'm, you did. Really yeah. That. And I'm talking in some specifics now, and so people might be getting a little like, what are you even talking about in this? So if you haven't watched this episode in a while, or you're wondering what we're talking about, or if you've never watched it at all, and for some reason listen to us before you go watch it, which is weird, but cool, and we appreciate it. Brent, why don't you tell us about Moments of Transition? Well, it was the night before, well, any other night. And all through B5, not a creature was stirring. It was about a quarter to five. Michael was all snuggled up in his bed while visions of Psycor brainwashing chambers danced in his head. When what to his wondering ears would sound, but a chime with a message that he had to answer right now. It was William Eggers, you see, Lisa's new husband. Oh joy, yippee. But Michael is on Eggers' payroll, you know, and he had a job for him. And Michael couldn't say no. There's a package that Michael has to get through, but Zach is on to him. Oh, what should he do? I know, Michael said. It's a telepath I need. And I know one named Lita, and it's money that she needs. She's trying to find a job since Kosh left her high and dry. The Vorlon stopped paying her bills, and the rent is quite high. So Lita will have to move to smaller quarters, it seems because she can't find a job. And you know what that means. Enter Bester from Psychor, who will help her, no doubt, with one caveat. He gets her body when she ultimately checks out. In the end, Bester gets her. And he's got Garibaldi, too? His plan is working quite nicely. I wonder, what's he going to do? But that's not where our story ends today. Oh, no, that's just the B plot. So here is plot A. The Mimbari are at war, and it's not very civil, it seems. The warrior cast is winning, and Delenn is going to bend the knee. In front of the entire planet, she surrenders to those fools. But she has the upper hand because she knows the ancient rules. Whenever there's a dispute, a beam of light will shine down. The leaders will get in and the pain will be quite profound. 
It will show who is for the people and who is for themselves. And the first to leave the light will lose and the fighting will be quelled. So Delenn gets in first and Shakiri gets in next, but Shakiri can't stand it. So Delenn is the best, but she doesn't get out either. She's trying to prove a point. She is the leader that they all should anoint. But then she falls down flat and Naroon saves her head, but he stays in the light and winds up quite dead. Now Delenn reforms the great council, but not the same as before. This time the worker cast will have five while the other two combine for four. So once again, we see that Brent was absolutely right. His crown rests safely on his head. And now Jeff, tell us about this episode. What did you like? Brent, that was amazing. That was so good. <laughs> Can I just react to your recap this whole time? <laughs> How long did that take you? That was incredible. Uh, that probably took about 30, 30 minutes or so to, to come up with. I, I got to be honest. It was one of those. I was sitting there the whole time going, this is either going to be the best thing I've ever done or it's going to be the stupidest thing I've ever done. This might be our last episode. <laughs> We're not going to top that. We're like, we just, you just reached the top of the mountain. That was, that was so good. And, and on today of all days, if you're watching this in the future, this came out on Christmas day. So. Oh, that's yeah. 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 Good point. It's, yeah, absolutely. somebody's gonna be like, "What's the what's the big deal?" But <laughs> hello, to everyone well in the future, by the way. Yeah, hello from us uh, both in the past and the future yes. to you now. Well, we were always here, Jeff. Always. All right, to the episode then, I guess. To me, this all happened too fast. Mm. I am super satisfied with how it ended. Yeah, but I we talked about this a little last week. I never felt the impact or the devastation of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I never felt real danger. I frankly was never concerned about Minbar mm. at all. Yeah. Like it's like, oh, well, there's stuff going on there. I think last week I talked about Valen was going to come back. You know, like uh, kind of talked about him coming to bring order again. And then I thought Narun was going to chrysalis himself. I like you talked about. I think maybe JMS was just really competently and artistically dropping these seeds, but this. This, I mean, it kind of came out the way we thought it was going to come do, out. Do you know what I think would have helped hmm. is you remember how last week we were saying they showed these images of Minbar and it looked fine. The images they had of Minbar today should have been the last should have been the ones from last week. The images of Delenn walking through the hall and the people are just littered in the hall injured should have been in last week. Mm -hmm. I think that would have amped that up quite a bit. Um, but I hear, I hear you on the, it didn't feel real last week at all. Yeah. Which I think took a lot out of this one for me. Mm -hmm. Just at least, at least in the beginning, it's just like, oh, okay. I guess we're going to, I guess we're going to wrap this little, little kerfuff up. Right. But I did. I loved, I loved the Bester, the Garibaldi, Zach stuff, Lita, all of it. This to me, I mean, the Minbari stuff was awesome. And in the, the canon of Babylon five is significant and huge, but this episode, this show, all that stuff was the show yeah. to me. I really enjoyed it. It was them at their best. Like Garibaldi is, is living his dream and still finding stuff to complain about. Like it's just, yeah. that's Garibaldi today. Lita struggling with her new role and the transitions in her life as well, I thought was really good and realistic. Zach, dude, I want a friend like Zach. Yeah. He's a great friend to Garibaldi. He's a great friend to, to Lita. And I think in this episode, we, we've talked about it a little bit before, but in this episode, it really showed he, I, I think he is a better head of security than Garibaldi was. Yeah. Dude is super competent, super effective. He's great. And I loved Bester on here. I mean, seriously, how kind of him to come all the way to Babylon 5 to offer to help Lita in her trying time. So giving and gracious of him. 
we've been kind of, you and I have been kind of, I don't want to say complaining, but we've been critical about some of the pacing of this season so far. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't think that's going to be the case from this point forward. Given how the episode ended and a couple of the other pieces, I feel like it we're going to be moving from this point forward. But yeah, this was, I really, I, I loved this episode. This was great. I want to pick up on what you just said there at the end. I 100% agree. I, I feel like we got into the spot where everything got set up through season three. And then we had this amazing, tightly packed six episode run to start the season. These last, how many episodes has it been now? Eight episodes? Seven. Have come back to uh, almost a world building type situation, a a resetting Mm -hmm. of where we are. And it feels like, Jeff, it feels like you're absolutely right. Like when, when Ivanova comes in at the end and she's like, I can't believe those bastards. They blew up these ships and, and. Sheridan just goes, that's it. We're, we're going for the colonies and then for Mars and then for earth. And we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep going. And if they knock us down, we're going to come back again and we're going to get them and we're going to go, go, go. Something's about to go down. Yeah. And I've got a feeling, what, what do we have? We have like six, seven episodes left of the season, right? From here. Next week's episode 15. We go to 22, yeah. so seven episodes. Yeah. Oh, my God. So we're yeah. going to start with a six-episode crunch. This middle seven, eight-episode reset world build. Do do what you got to do to kind of get us in a situation. I've, I'm hoping, Jeff, I'm hoping beyond hope that these next seven episodes, six episodes, are this tightly packed you know, end the yeah. season like that. That'd be that'd be so dope. Yeah, I'd love it. What were your first reactions to this one? I I liked this episode a lot. Like you, I really, I really, really did. This episode to me, Jeff, was the perfect example of good writing, particularly in television, where you set up an audience's expectations and then you deliver on it. I know that it's super popular today to subvert expectations. It's the cool thing to do, man. We're going to do it this way, and then we're not going to give it to you, and we're going to subvert your expectations because we're Hollywood and we're awesome. Unfortunately, that has become so commonplace that it's just not effective anymore, and honestly, it's annoying. When you set me up and say, I'm going to take you down this path, and you start taking me down this path, but then you took you you take the sharp right and you do something completely different. That's annoying, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. This episode was not that. This was this was JMS telegraphing everything that's about to happen, and then doing it in a way though that you didn't necessarily expect. Like that's where the genius of it comes in. I'm going to telegraph everything I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it in a way you didn't expect, which makes good TV. And I'm here for it. And honestly, almost the, the subverting expectations idea now to me actually seems lazy writing. Mm. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to set you up. Then I'm going to go do something else altogether. Cause I can't figure out how to do what I told you I'm going to do and do it in a cool way. So I'm going to go do something hope, else altogether and hope you forget yeah. about this really cool yeah. thing I set up. Right. Um, looking at you, Star Trek Discovery season three and four, or Picard and season one and two and uh, two, 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 two was pretty we, much exactly what it was all the way through. That was a buzz for the Star Trek reference. Not because I was wrong about Picard season two. You were, but it's, <laughs> Hey Jeff, this is not a Star Trek podcast. I know. That's why I just said it's fine because that's the end of the conversation. So. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. So I quite like this episode. Uh, frankly, Jeff, I don't know that I have enjoyed an episode this much at, since the end of the Vorlon shadow war. Wow. Like wow. I really enjoyed this episode, but you're right. The first half of this episode was weird, particularly with the Delin stuff. Because it didn't feel like anything was happening. It was just Delenn walking around going, okay, well, I guess we're going to surrender now. 
And then Shakiri going, we're going to surrender. They're going to surrender to us. Woohoo. And then, okay, we surrender now. Like there was, there was nothing happening. They were just sort of exactly. doing until, you know, Delenn went full on Aslan on, uh, <laughs> on Shakiri, man. Uh, question about Shakiri. Yeah. Was that the same actor that played Ducat? I don't sure think so. It seemed like it to me. Did it really? His face seemed a little more round, like a little more pudgy, but he had a lot of the same mannerisms, a lot of the same same look, that same like goatee look going on. It probably wasn't at all, but it just I don't think really so. This guy seemed this guy seemed kind of clumsy, just like big and oafish and and not in a way that the actor would have portrayed. Like I feel like that was the actor like th not that the actor was bad by yeah. any means i think is exactly what he was supposed to be yeah. but ducat just had an air uh, dude ducat glided when he walked he was yeah. so cool man he was cool yeah yeah shakiri was quarterback of his high school football team he scored four touchdowns in one game like he's that guy and he never stopped telling that story yeah. ever yeah D dated the uh the the head of the cheerleading squad and then never got past his high school glory days exactly lived there so he went yeah joined the military and became shy elite yeah and and literally just like apparently let everyone play him like a fiddle that guy just seemed wildly politically incompetent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know he he gets to this uh I, I guess we're gonna talk about him since we're here he gets into his monologue with with him and naroon and mm -hmm. i want to talk about naroon for a sec last week we had some lots of discussion about Naroon and what was going on and double agent or you said is he a triple agent mm -hmm. he's going back and forth Jeff let me let me ask you because I certainly had a take on it what did you think was going on with Naroon as you watched this episode was he actually a triple agent through that or what was going on with him the second he walked into the door and started going toe to toe with Shakiri I was like oh this is him and Delenn. That's their plan. Like this, there's no oh, you thought so? anything. Oh yeah. Like immediately I was like, okay, yeah, they're just, they're just doing their plan. He's here to take down Shakiri and set something up. Oh, wow. I didn't catch that at all. Really? No. Mm -mm. No. What did you uh, think? Well, I, I, I read him, I think exactly as he was being played, which was Naroon is a warrior cast guy. He is for the warrior cast. He wants to see the warrior cast come over however when he's hearing shakiri begin to talk and shakiri says words like um what, what did he say uh, uh life and death are just but two results for the warrior like either one's fine i'm not saying death is something to be scared of or be frightened of but you know it, it's better if we're alive yeah I, it I, reminded I, me <laughs> like it reminded me of the uh the gem hadar who would die before they went into a value into a battle and then if they lived that was the bonus but they went into battle completely assuming they were going to die right. or were already dead right or, i mean even the, the klingons going you know today is a good day to die let's go die in battle who mm -hmm. um uh but Nar it's almost like naroon has certainly been impacted by delenn mm -hmm. he carries yeah. that but he also is acting as a double agent and now that he's in with his boss i think we're watching him and you're looking watching the look on his face where doubt is really beginning to creep in and you know who he reminded me of veer and londo and he's kind of doing that like second guessing what he's doing and i and and oh oh even better than that darth vader from empire strikes back once the emperor starts talking to luke where even through his mask you can kind of see darth vader kind of going hmm it's like, what? something's not right here like this doesn't feel right this doesn't mm -hmm. sit right this isn't okay and at the end naroon pulls a full-on darth vader where he picks <laughs> yeah throws her out but then for whatever reason he stayed in the light and i renounce my warrior cast i my heart is religious <laughs> And then he went, yeah. I, I didn't read it as doubt on his face. I read it as disgust. Interesting. Okay. Hey, uh, the, you guys out there, um, if you're listening to this, email us to Babylon five first at gmail.com. The number five and the word first, and let us know 
how you read this. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hi everybody at YouTube, comment down below to let us know. Cause I'm, I'm, re yeah. I'm really interested how the people out there, I uh, took this or tweet us. You can tweet at us at Babylon five first, first. Babylon first, just Babylon. First. Babylon first. Yeah, Cause I think Babylon in this, what, and where I really felt that he was already, like he was just executing the plan was he came into Shakiri and I almost think he was like giving him a chance. Mm. Like, dude, I'm going to, I'm going to say these things. I'm going to ask you these questions and like, I'm going to give you a chance to show me that you're cool. Mm -hmm. Cause if you're not like, I've already talked to Delenn and, and we're, we're going to, we're going to see this thing through. And I think that when Shakiri started monologuing, not only was he disappointed in what he said, but he was absolutely just disgusted with it. And it just steeled his resolve where I think that's almost, I still think like, I, I, I still think that in Narun's heart, he says, I'm a, I'm religious through and through or whatever, you know, at the end, I, I still think though that Narun specifically doesn't care about warrior cast or religious cast. Narun cared about Minbari. Yeah. And I think, and, and I think that when Shakiri was talking, that was his thing where he's just like, you're so one-sided in this. You, you, not only can you not see the other side, you're going to destroy the other side when he just sees, like Dolan said last week, he sees justice and he sees them in Bari. And I think maybe the only way culturally he had to express that was to change casts. But I think that if, I don't know if there was more time mm -hmm. given to this story or something, I could definitely see him being like, I renounce my cast yeah. and I am just Narun of Minbar. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what I find in that is, um, I don't know how things are up there in the Northwest, Jeff. I've, I've told you, I was reading good old Kentucky, good old Kentucky boy. I love my home state to everyone who's in Kentucky. Hello. I miss home. I love you people. I really do. There are certain ways that I was raised, Jeff, certain mm -hmm. environments I was raised in that as I've gotten older and more worldly and uh, more wise, um, I've realized are absolutely abominable situations, ideals, and things to be in. I've grown. I've changed as an individual, you know, and I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect at all. However, I will tell you, there is still at times a, a, like an initial response that is not good. And that response is a hundred percent ingrained in me as someone who was raised in this sort of situation. But then the grown up adult kind of comes in and goes, Hey, don't be stupid. Let's tamp mm -hmm. that down. Like, like there's that initial response. And it's, you know, you, you know, as you, as you get a, an adult, like you have a filter now, like before it comes out, like it gets caught and you're like, no, 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 I, I gotta, no, that's not good. I like to think we all have this little, uh Oh, I don't know what's going on with the rest of you out there. Jeff just froze on me unless I'm frozen on him. Yeah, I think. Can you hear me? I all? can. I you I are. Yeah, you're getting weird on me, but now you're back. Yep. Well, hold on. I just had a weird thing happen. Okay. Like my whole, like my, my entire screen just went through your. Oh, okay. I'm glad to know it's you and not me because at least it's. That was at weird. least not it. Welcome to behind the scenes here at YouTube. Yeah. Stuff that happens while we're in the middle. Are you good? Yeah, you're fine. fine. Yeah, you look good right now. Okay. I don't have the connection. That was weird. I wonder what happened. Uh, just up in what? the. In your ISP, yeah. blame them. Blame Xfinity. They're the best. Yes. They're the best. Yes. Um, what were we we're talking about? Kentucky. Yeah. What I was I was saying about how oh, you yeah. had an initial reaction. And yeah, then, the guy. Do what? I said. Yeah. My I have a story about a guy. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we all have this guy who like sits right here, like, like on in your the neck? back of our throat. Like, not on our neck, in our throat. It's not a controller keeper person. We don't have one of those. Mm -hmm. But we have a like a guy with a flag mm -hmm. in our throat and a thought comes forward and he's like, go ahead, go ahead, or nope, yeah. nope. And some of us are really, really bad at negotiating our union contracts with that guy. <laughs> and he tends to get longer breaks for a lot of us than, than others. Yeah. And that doesn't always work well, out so and, well. You know, and I think that's where social media gets so many people in trouble because he lives in the throat and social media is accessed through the fingers. Exactly. You know, and like you don't have the filter through the fingers that you need that guy who's in your throat and <laughs> going, hey, nope, no, nope, don't do that. Right. We need to get more innovative in how we f hire and find these yeah. people. 
because they were they're, they're desperately needed right, right? um but that's that reminds me of Narun. like he he is raised he is warrior cast he has a certain set of values and ideals and where he's going but as he has interacted with Delin and he's gotten more and more into leadership and he's seen how things are i think you're right jeff he is more for Minbar than he is for the warrior cast, which is absolutely how it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it causes him to question the who and the why of how they do things and has resulted in a change. Jeff, I'll be really interested. Uh, and I think this would be a great podcast topic about Babylon 5 when we're not doing rewatches. Yeah. yeah, like okay. when we're just kind of doing topical conversations about Babylon 5, tracking Narun's character arc from where we saw him in season one. And what's he what's he had? Four episodes, maybe? Something like that. Four or five episodes. But tracking that story, that growth, and that journey from a dude who is pissed off at Sinclair and Delenn and the religious cast for stopping the war when we were on the threshold of victory to my heart is religious cast Blah. you can see some of the because like in legacies like he was trying to frame delenn and sinclair and do all this horrible stuff he had that peak apology that we always that we talked about quite a bit and always refer to and then stuff happened and he was on the great council i, I forgot about the his... apology at the end of that episode where we're like so it was so solid Despite mm -hmm. everything, he was solid in that. I forgot about that, Jeff. And you should remember it because I think that's the moment when you came up with the theory that Sinclair was going to be Minbari because he said, Narun said to Sinclair, you sound like a Minbari. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's like, yeah, of course I do. I actually I wrote the books that told you how to be a Minbari. I don't know that yet, <laughs> but, I, right. but I did. But then he went on, he bent knee to Delenn as Intilza. Uh-huh after he the great council stuff but when he was for, in great after he took over the great council and took over her spot and was like ha 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 i'm warrior cast and now we're in super majority and and we're going to maintain the racial purity mm -hmm. of our people and then to go to to where he ended yeah it's an incredible arc and i think i i you alluded to it a couple times and i don't i i understand why delenn stayed in in that beam of light like i understand her um, look at me and look how sacrificial and powerful I am and how I'm going to go all the way. I get that with the Len. I don't really understand why Narun stayed in there. Yeah. That doesn't, it, it it's powerful. It was dramatic, mm -hmm. but I don't get it. He could have easily stepped in, you know, got her out, stepped out and then said, I am religious cast. And people could have said, yay. But at the end of it all, Delenn's going to ride this train that she saved in United Minbar, but what you and I know is Naroon saved Minbar. Sure. Um, so let me ask you this. When Delenn got in the light, did it occur to you it didn't really seem to bug her that much? Like, there is a few little like, oh, wow, that's uncomfortable. But she was just chilling. And then Shakiri steps in and he's like, oh my God, that hurts. Ah, ooh, ooh, ah. But Delenn was like, nah, I'm good. Let's just hang out. Like, and she gets out of it after everything that happened. And you know what? She just got some sun on her cheeks. <laughs> you know, she had the cane, sure, but she, yeah. she looked like me after a day at the ballpark with my kids. <laughs> yeah, she it didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense. She was in there longer than both of them combined. Yeah. yeah. I, I almost wonder if it like, and I would, I would totally accept this as an explanation. Her half human physiology mm. saved that somehow that I would fully accept that as an explanation in the sci-fi world. Yeah. That would make It'd be sense. a cheap explanation, but I would, I would. Or, or the other one that uh, women are awesome and have a much higher pain tolerance than men. Could be that. And I'll 100% back that up because, my God, what my wife endures silently is phenomenal. Right. Um, okay, so let's talk about reforming the Great Council, Jeff. 
Brilliant. Yeah, why don't you? Hold on while I just take the clip from last week and, and drop it in you. here. And Yeah. Uh, bro, I mean, brilliant. Absolutely. I mean, it was presented in in a way that that needed i don't know that i really expected that to be the way it went down um i'm curious what delenn's role is going to be in it moving yeah, forward because it really seemed like she's like so you guys are the nine you're going to do this but i called you forward mm -hmm. and we're going to leave this one space open to honor narun until she said this line until the one who comes or the one who is coming or something like that yeah. is it David? sheridan oh is it share oh sheridan's gonna come in and take over the great council or or well, for part of the ooh, because sheridan is the one who will be right that's uh, that well that was my first thought i was like well that can't be sheridan and then i remembered you had suggested it could be david at some point <laughs> Because yeah, maybe he, because maybe there is the fourth one, the one who is come. There's the one who was, the one who is, the one who will be, and the one who is coming. That's what she said. The and one that who is coming. Mm -hmm. The one who is coming. Yeah. 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 I read it as Sheridan when she said that, mm -hmm. but it could also be David. But still, it's does does she appoint these people and peace out? That doesn't seem in character for Delenn. No, no. I, I mean, and if she is going to be involved on whatever level, now it's a council of nine. And the religious cast has one over on the warrior cast. <laughs> Just yeah, say it. she comes in. Yeah, you know. And so where's where's all that? She's a non-voting member of the of the the whole thing. I would really love to see. I I really wish that you. I really wish that your prediction would have been correct. In that, whether it was Narun or Delin, would have just destroyed the caste system. Because I will also say this, I've never truly been comfortable with the idea of a caste system. It Agreed. seems so antithetical to a good society. Uh, whenever, and whenever we think of caste systems here on earth, it's never in a good situation. And I can't no. imagine it being a good situation over there. Even when we heard about it on Deep Space Nine and kira and they had their remember that was that one episode in deep space nine where they wanted to take everybody back to their the other the other emissary the person who thought yeah. he was the emissary came in he's like we have to go back to the caste system right that's what we're we got to follow and, your and dajaras. that was the word yeah. your dajara and immediately families were breaking up yeah. uh battle lines were being yeah. drawn like immediately there was conflict yeah. amongst everyone not good so I really was hoping that the cast system would just break up altogether. Is that my third? I, that was, okay. yeah. And I think I've done two. We're, we're, we're running through That's them this okay. time. I, but yeah, I think without completely changing the paradigm, which I think they would have needed more time to do mm -hmm. effectively. This is a great, this is a great outcome. We talked about it at length last week, but it, 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 it it's the workers they build. Delenn said it well. They build. They create. We destroy and take down. So the ones who are building and actually enriching our society are the ones who need to tell us what direction and we're, she we're going this. in. And she said this. She said this. We exist to serve them, not the other way around. And I was like, yes. It's like, that you. is exactly what is true. Oh. Jeff, do you have anything else about this whole Delin Minbari Civil War thing? Not really. Okay. Um, if I could kick off our whole discussion about Garibaldi and Lita and Bester and all of this, uh, can can we just declare that uh Mr. Edgars is also uh Charlie from Charlie's Angels? Okay, okay. Same dude. Gotta be the same. Dude. I have a I have a different theory. Oh, what's that? I think Bester might be William Edgars. No. Wow. No. So I'm going to check off, finally gets to record a log. And in that log, he basically tells us that he's the guy who programmed Garibaldi. Yes. What? Yes. And it's going well, according to plan. Yeah. Here's the thing. Was Bester really there to get leader or was he just there to check in on Garibaldi? I, I think that's what he was there yeah. for. He was just there to check in. And he, he oh. told Zach right at the beginning, he's like, look, I'm not here for you. I'm not here for anybody. Uh, what are you here for? I'm here for my own personal stuff. Get out of my way. 
And Zach still hassled him. And while he was there, he took care of the Lita stuff. It's two for one, you know. Right, he's there. Why not? Yeah, save the trip. I thought Bester was going to come in and save him, but he did it. But also, between that log and then right after that log, it went over to the call um, with with Edgar's. Yeah. And, you know, so he had to, he has to fire Lita because he hates telepaths and doesn't want them around. Zach said there's never been a picture of this guy. Nobody knows what he looks like. According to Lisa's story, uh, was that uh, a couple weeks ago, if I get my years right, they met in 2260, which is the same year, it's just last season, after Bester's... Uh, Carolyn, after his lover got iced by the shadows. So Bester, we know Bester's a busy guy. He started, you know, the Omega, the Black Omega, whatever thing. Yeah, He's yeah. doing all these medical experiments. Stuff. Why not start an intergalactic company and become a super rich well, guy? He's also looking for side. whatever this thing was that Lise was trying to get that does something for telepaths. Right? Or virus that targets telepaths or something like that. Like... He's looking for a cure that would make well, so sense I, in the world. So they say it's a cure. I think it's the virus. Well, that's how and you I find the cure is through the virus, right? Like if you can map the virus, then you can find the cure, right? Correct. I think so. But I don't think they're interested in finding the cure. I think they're interested in propagating a virus. Mm. Or, or based on what Bester said with Lita, he's interested in figuring out how to ramp up people's powers. And maybe there's something in that. So this is my harebrained theory yeah. is just that Bester is Edgar. Okay. So you just mentioned something that I actually spent a bit of time talking about this on the Brent watches video and to go back to the brilliant writing of JMS, you know how you and I have been a little harsh, not harsh. I think fairly critical yep. of this idea that Nothing is dropped in the Babylon 5 universe. If JMS lays it down, it's going to come to fruition. And you and I have kind of been like, yeah, but what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? Yeah, we've talked about doing the two-hour-long episode of dropped plot points. <laughs> right. um, this episode, 100% could not have happened with Bester going to Lita saying, I want your body for when you die because you have been enhanced. And he basically said, look, we tried the Jason Ironheart thing. That didn't work. We tried putting two people together and breeding them. That didn't work. We have not been successful at all in advancing telepaths. You have been advanced and we want to figure out why that conversation, that whole piece would not have been possible. Had it not been for Jason Ironheart, for stoner, for all those lurker telepaths down below with the rogues, none, this would not be anywhere near as important if we didn't have those pieces set up. And I'm looking, and if, if, if Bester is Edgar's, I, I, I hate it. 100% can do voice change automation. I'm not even worried about that. That is a caveat. I hate it and I love it at the same time, Jeff. And if that's the case, because there's this thing that's going to do something to telepaths and Garibaldi has been, he's in something's going on with his head and he's doing something. And this whole piece that while Sheridan is going off half cocked on um, Clark trying to solve that, here's Garibaldi and Bester and Lita trying to figure out this whole thing with the telepaths. Don't forget what the other thing the telepaths did earlier that we saw. They teamed up with the shadows. Yes. You know, and, and remember that scene where there was, there was Morden and then the psychop and the Senator, like all three in cahoots. Well, now we've got to, we've got to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's pretty wild good writing. Stuff, I just, but... I'm putting that down. Yeah. Good, good writing throughout like this. This is a good pickup. I, I enjoyed this. I and I think too, with with all of that, it made it made his offer to Lita honestly less creepy. Sure. With all of that context. And it, one, it was hilarious. Well, I want your body. <laughs> what? Right. How dare you? 
I thought that was great. But when you but when you when you take the emotion out of it and you just look at the deal itself, she has to wear the badge, wear the gloves, and give ten percent to the core. Did and then her body Did you did you hear the phrase that, that Bester said about that? Which in the nineties would not have been a thing, but here in the recent times it has become a big thing. He said you would be core in name only. She would be a oh. spino. Or a kino, kino, a kino, a kino. Yeah, yeah. She'd be, she'd be a kino, a sino. Oh, sino, a sino. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. Um, I just, I thought that was funny. That was good. For those of you uh, outside of the United States, find an American friend and ask them, uh, why? Yeah, why that's it's a whole, whole fun conversation. But yeah, so no, it's not badge gloves 10 percent to the core give up your body when you die from natural causes but you get to go operate you get to do your practice you get to rock and roll do whatever you want to do for the rest of your life yeah it's not a bad deal and, and i think given how hard bester specifically has worked mm -hmm. to enhance telepaths and then having it right in front of you and and take bester take what people see as evil bester out of it just out of sheer curiosity of how do we ramp up this superpower we have we know bester won't hesitate to dissect someone because he did he did it and just blurted it out but no with lita he's like no you go live your life in fact i only want your body if you die from natural causes i feel like there's a caveat that he could take advantage of but whatever Probably maybe with that little virus that he's, that he's uh, trying to That's get there is right. Uh -huh. um, but no, I thought it was, I thought it was a good deal, but I also understand the trauma associated that, you know, for Lita, that last scene with her ring ring, it was pretty heavy. That's a heavy scene. So I have two but, questions coming out of this whole thing. Okay. Um, one, just how far, has Lita's psi abilities been enhanced? Because she said officially I'm five, but I'm way more badass than that. Well, even hey, what's your range? Oh, 20, 30 meters. Yeah, no, what is it? Really? A lot more. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. So what how what ha, what can she do? What is she actually able of doing? She immediately knew that Bester turned around and scanned Garibaldi. He didn't he didn't even scan her. She just knew. And Garibaldi, like, man, he would have lost it. Yeah. Um, also, speaking of Garibaldi, what path does Bester need Garibaldi to follow? I don't know. I know. I have no, this one, I have no idea where this is going. Not a clue. That's another reason why I, I have that Edgar's theory is like, because Bester could never get Garibaldi to work for him. Yeah. Never. But Edgar's can. Yeah. But why does is that Garibaldi? Why would he need Garibaldi? Like. Well, because who who else can can waltz in to, you know, Sheridan's office and have information? Just he knows just, stuff about just just to get stuff through customs and Babylon five. Like that, that's a pretty big deal when you're working with this stuff, because but the thing is, I don't think it's just Babylon Five. Like he's got contacts in on all the League worlds. He's got contacts on Minbar, Centauri, the Narn. He's got. I mean, he he could go to Jakar, right, and ask for anything. Is this Bester trying to destabilize Sheridan? I think so. I think or so. well, because didn't, didn't no. okay go back to things that got dropped. Didn't Bester say your war is now my war? I know that war is over, but still, like, and really, Bester's beef was with Sinclair. Yeah, but but Sheridan really stepped in it as Just well. Kind of picked it up. Because, I mean, we got Oren Zento in by any means necessary that Bester sent at him and other people. Like, that was kind of thing that was coming up. And then Sheridan immediately, you know, oh, you need to watch, go watch these episodes. Go, I've got, here's the, the VHS for Mind War, Captain. You can watch this mm -hmm. and find out how this guy's a jerk water. And then immediately, like, they won't give that guy a second chance, but. I loved though know, when Garibaldi chased after him after he scanned and he oh, yeah. clocked him and then he just kind of looks up and Zach's just looking at him. He's like, "How's it going? Come on, Mister Bester." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, uh, just to show how absolutely absurd it is, um, 
Garibaldi turning everything around on Zach in that in that moment like hey man you're, you're doing this isn't like oh really what about everything having to do here and what about this and what about that um this is a classic case of something that is still relatively new to us called what aboutism mm. i'm going to point out what you did wrong but instead of actually addressing it you're going to say what about all this other stuff over here when actually the question is what are you doing yeah, as a manager, we call that deflection, yeah. right? And as it happens all the time, hey, so you blah, blah, blah. Well, so-and-so, such and such, and you blah. We're not talking about so-and-so. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about you. Yeah. And here's this, so let's let's get in it. And I the, the note I even made on it was a big part of Garibaldi's push was, I mean, everything here is an illegal operation anyway. So, I mean, why can you? Did that just, them making an illegal action like this does not justify your illegal activity. Whether we're illegal or not is irrelevant. What's relevant is that you're violating, violating rigs that you, you helped put into place. Right. I love that Zach and Lita are clearly doing it. Oh, you think you think they're that far? See, I didn't. I oh didn't, yeah. I didn't think they were that far just yet. I said like, it's I want the, them to become a thing. I said uh, they're 100% together and absolutely doing it. It's the subtle B5 relationship cue for that. The way he just kind of put his his hand on her back. and I, you know, I, just I'm, the... I'm totally here for them being an item. I, I just didn't think they had gone anywhere close to that far yet. But, hey, if they have, I'm all for it. The only reason I'd say they hadn't is when he says, hey, you got to downsize, he should have been like, but I got some pretty sweet quarters. Yeah, I just upsized. I got a yeah. promotion. I got a new one. Want to uh, want to move in? Want to take up some of that room? Yeah. Um. Hey, Bester. I didn't. I didn't appreciate, and it didn't work quite as well. I didn't appreciate the rip off of a Jeff Foxworthy joke, where he he says he says, uh, uh, "It's nice to know that they're still hiring from the shallow end of the dream pool." Ah. Uh. And I was like, it didn't, it didn't, it's a Jeff Foxworthy joke about, uh, marrying your cousins as a redneck, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure Jeff Foxworthy doesn't own the market on the phrase, the shallow end of the gene pool, but, uh, it, it, just, it was still there. It, that particular joke just didn't quite come out. Although I think I did laugh at it, but, but I think, I think how it followed up also like didn't do well either. Cause he's like, uh said something about humanity and he's like, humanity is my business. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Mar Marley and Scrooge. Yeah. Eh? Well, guess what, Mr. Garibaldi? Um, the actual quote, I'm going to be that guy for a second. Uh, the actual line is mankind is my business. And then Marley goes on to talk about like charity and welfare and benevolence is his business. So yeah, not, not good. Not good quote placement. Yeah. Maybe not as well read as you're making people think you are yeah. yeah maybe put him and marcus in a room together and see who can talk. get the dickens out of each other uh uh so jeff other than that i mean the setup for the next episode or the next bunch of episodes the war is on they're yeah. gone we've got we've got the league in place the white star fleet has its backup with the alliance um garibaldi is going to mars we heard that He's going to Mars, and so whatever's yeah. going to happen there is going to happen there. I think we're probably going to see more lease here in the near future. Um, we're but but they gave us the map. We'll go to the colonies, and then we'll take Mars, and then we're going to Earth. We got seven episodes. I'm assuming this is going to wrap up by the season end. Uh, we got seven episodes to get there. Yeah. Yep. It's the path we are. We're on it, and so at this point in the episode, we're at the point. Or we boil this all down. We're going to check and see if there, this episode has any deep moral messages, any, uh, hold, maybe it's holding up a mirror to society, maybe giving us hope that we'll be better in the future. Doesn't seem to be a thing we've gotten much of in the series here lately, but you're going to do that, Brent, by rating this episode on a scale of zero to five Delta theories as to how strong the message or morals are and just how Babylon five, they were delivered. Well, Jeff, I, there was there was a lot of good little lines that certainly could be uh, brought out. In every battle, one side or the other must eventually surrender. 
You know, like that's a good point. Is it a big Star Trek message? Is it a big thing? Not really, but it's something you certainly could dwell on. Um, I liked when Delenn said this, we surrendered, but we did not give up our sovereign rights. I thought that was really cool. However, I thought that there was one overarching glaring star trek specific message that was meant written in intended by the writer and it wasn't even a line that was said it was just what happened delin beats shakiri she ended the civil war with knowledge with discussion with diplomacy effectively that is such a star trek thing you didn't have to fire a weapon no swords were drawn this was we're going to look at what's going on we're going to outsmart you we're going to think about it and we're going to follow the rules and then we're going to test your resolve to see who you really are and see what's going on um you don't beat your enemies with muscles you beat them with the brain and in the end she wound up winning over Naroon. right because he saw the light may have actually won her over way before or won him over sorry way before but you know it became very very public at that point this is such a star trek thing jeff that i'm i am tempted to just go full five star furies or, or delta furies i'm sorry however the other side of that is how uniquely babylon 5 was this story and frankly i don't think it was that uniquely babylon 5. i don't know that this particular star trek message is really star trek like this just is a message that exists in sci-fi i think a lot of times right it exists um in storytelling uh, we call it a, a star trek message because it's there but i think this also you could have taken the same situation put it in any star trek episode uh you take the same situation put it in star wars put it in doctor who put it in uh battle put it in any sci-fi situation and change your characters change a little bit of dialogue here and there but it plays the same and so I don't think it was that uniquely Babylon five way, um, outside of just the fact it was Minbar and things there. So unfortunately that's actually going to knock it down for me, but I do think that message is so strong. I'm giving this one four Delta Furies. Here's where I'll challenge you a little bit on how Babylon five, it was delivered because that same approach was used by Bester. Bester used knowledge. Bester used discussion. Bester used diplomacy to set up situations that basically forced Lita to come face to face with the reality she needed to sign that agreement. So we have Delenn using that for the forces of good. We had Bester using it for the forces of what we're assuming is not good. Does that, but it was the same thing. Can I, can I ask though? Does that assume that Bester is Eggers? And he manipulated that situation to push her back. It does. Yes. See, I'm not entirely sold on that idea though. I'm not entirely sold on that idea. Which is I'm just saying two for two on big overarching theme. Yeah. I had Valen, I had Anna. I'm just, I mean, maybe, maybe, um, I'm going to stick with four Delta furies, but I appreciate it. I appreciate with where you're going. Bester's is still, even, even though Bester would have done that, it was in such a shady way. Because Lita rejoining the core is not, uh, Bester didn't do that for Lita's um, benefit. benefit. He did it solely for his own. And the fact that he could get, let her have some benefit to get her to agree to do it, no skin off his back. He doesn't care. It's not going to affect him. You know, he's, he's really doing it for selfish reasons. So I'm going to stick with four Delta Furies. All right. Yeah, that works. Now, Jeff, you don't get a say in really what the Delta Furies are. You could try to sway me. It didn't work this time. It has worked nope. before in the past. Did not work this time. But you, my friend, get the final say today 
in the 100% completely, absolutely accurate and definitive ranking of season four of Babylon five, because Jeff, you get to rank this one. Now I know where I would rank this one, but you, my friend, get to rank this one. I'm curious where you're going to put it. If it's going to break the top five, our current top five, I'll remind the folks playing along at home are number one into the fire. Number two, the long night. Number three, atonement. Number four, whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi and number five rumors, bargains, and lies. Jeff, where do you place moments of transition? This is absolutely going to be in the top five for sure. My question for myself is, does it plop in at number four or number five. I'm definitely putting it above rumors, bargains, and lies. That was a great episode. This was a better episode. Great. This was had more impact. It was better executed, everything about it. But then I look at whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi. And at first, like when I first look at that episode title, I think of fun. Like I enjoyed so much of that episode. Marcus and Jakar running around trying to find stuff. But the end of that episode, Jakar and Chains coming in on on Centauri Prime was just, I mean, Doesn't that's it set feel up. like last season. It feels Doesn't so it long feel ago. feel like season three. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. And I think where I get it, where I'm going to put this one is based on my realization that the story threads laid out in that moment when Jakar showed up aren't done. We could say it was finished when the Narn or when the Centauri left the Narn homeworld, but we're seeing with Jakar, he's got his eye. We saw him and Londo kind of come together a little bit in agreeing to let the, the White Stars patrol. I mean, they were in a room together and they were civil. It's wild. So I think there's more to come from do, that story. Do you, do you think Jakar noticed Londo sitting in the room with him? I know he said he hoped that he ne that pray, never happened. Pray I don't notice you ever again. I think he might have noticed him. I think he noticed him. Is that another plot thread that was dropped? I don't know, but <clears> I really, <throat> but I really want the Garibaldi. Or it's time, Jeff. It is time for Londo and Jakar as a buddy cop. I've called it for a couple of weeks. It is time to get Londo and Jakar as a buddy cop because, frankly, we have often talked about how awesome Jakar and Londo are together. We really have not truly seen it since season one. It's been so long. We really haven't seen it since season one. It's time to get back to it. Agreed. So you're based on that. One. Yeah, based on that and what's going to come still from there, I'm going to I'm going to call moments of transition our new number five. Um, I'm going to 100% totally agree with you on that one. I'm in full full. Uh, full agreement it just means that it's probably going to get knocked out i'm assuming as the season continues to unfold here over the next bunch of episodes it's quite possible we'll find out and brent that's it for moments of transition next week we're watching the season namesake no surrender oh, no retreat this is the 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 title of the whole season right it is and what is it again no surrender no retreat so we've never watched these episodes before. We don't read, read show descriptions, episode descriptions. We don't look at thumbnails, reviews, anything like that whatsoever. All we know is the title, No Surrender, No Retreat. And that's what this season is called as well. And this is the time we get to guess. We make our predictions. What is this episode going to be about based on that alone? Brent, what do you think No Surrender, No Retreat will be about? Yeah, this one I think is going to be real easy. I think we're starting uh, with the the plan that Sheridan laid out to the colonies first and then to Mars and then on to earth. So the white star fleet, along with the other people, they're going to go to at least one of the earth colonies and kick this whole thing off, you know, no retreat, no surrender. What's the one that we heard about? Uh, Proxima three. So Proxima three Mars are the two big ones. There was an Orion seven, okay. I think that has been brought up a couple of times, I, yeah. but then other than but that, wasn't Orion seven, colonies. like obliterated or something like that. I think so. Like that was, yeah, it was something like that. Um, yeah. I could be wrong. People out there are correcting me right now and that's fine. Um, but yeah, so I think we go to one of these colonies, whether it's Proxima three or not, I don't know, but we go to a colony and we start 
and here we go. We're going to go free the colony. You have seven episodes and we've got to make it all the way to earth. So I don't think that these episodes are going to slow play much of anything. I agree. What do you think? I think the exact same thing. We're all get specific though. Mm -hmm. And this is just me hoping. And this season has showed us that it's not afraid to bring things back from earlier seasons. So what I'm hoping for with it, Oh gosh, that is what I want now. He just changed my whole life. <laughs> right. There'll be some captain here and Sheridan. They'll be like, let's settle it. Oh, swamp rat dude. Die. Yeah. They're gonna, no, we can't blow each other up. We're going to do it this way, but you're not far off. What I hope happens is they come out over Proxima or whatever colony they're going to come mm -hmm. out over. And one of the ships there is the Hyperion commanded by captain Pierce. If you remember Pierce, he's the guy who came in a voice in the wilderness to take over um, the clash. He was the, with, the, uh, the black guy, right? Uh -huh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember who you're talking about. Yeah, he was great. I love. I think we loved Cap. He was yeah. a jerk to Sinclair, yeah. but he was doing his job and whatever. Yeah. I want to see what I want is for Sheridan and Pierce to have a back, like a back, you know, a, a back history, like a friendship or something. Uh -huh. And they have to like face off right there. So I want, I want that callback and I want to have like Sheridan leaning on like, dude, when we were at the, the battle of such and such, or when we were this, you gotta, you gotta understand, man. So, so that's my hope. So kind of want to see Liana Kimmer come back. I think she got blowed up. Oh yeah. When, uh, when, uh, Santiago's ship got blown oh, up, I think she there. was on, on it. Yeah, that could be, could be, could be it's too sad. Um, I wouldn't be mad if that turned out to be right, but you say something that I don't think is going to happen necessarily in the next episode, but whenever we do eventually get to earth, wouldn't it be something if like the last ship, the last line of defense is the Agamemnon oh. is Sheridan's old ship. Wow. Yeah. And, and maybe he takes it back over. Maybe they defect to him, something of that nature. But the Agamemnon comes back into it. And, oh, and Sheridan has to take command of it again or something. Like they seize it or whatever. Like that. Like his white star is going down. And the, his only, like, we got a lightweight. I can get onto the Agamemnon. He goes on and they're just like, Captain Sheridan, yay. And then he takes down Earth from the Agamemnon. Oh, that'd be something, man. That'd be sweet. Well, we're not going to find that out anytime soon, but we will find out what happens in No Surrender, No Retreat next week. Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it so much. Please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. Leave a rating and a review so we can read it here on the podcast and share this podcast. You just click a little share button. You send it to your friend who's either already in love with Babylon 5, has never seen the show, or is ready to fall in love with this incredible series. So, hey, Brett. Jeff. Until next, yeah. Um, do you remember that scene in this episode where Delenn surrendered to Shakiri? Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, well, I want to rewrite it a little bit because I think one little rewrite, one little line at the end would make the entire thing better. Okay, so, so right. I want to rewrite it. Uh, I'm going to be Delenn. I want you to be Shakiri. Just follow my lead. You'll know exactly what to do. Okay, cool? Okay, okay. All right, you ready? Let's do it. I surrender. You what? I surrender. I can't compete with you anymore. So, are you saying that I'm stronger than you? Sure. Stronger, but not wiser, you big old dummy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, in Valen's name. <laughs> I mean, we're not some, some deep space franchise. The station is about something. I love that outro. When you added Ivanova into that outro, oh, man, that just... Ah, it seals it. Yeah. Like, I almost want to go back to all of our old episodes and just cut that piece in. <laughs> right, just put it oh in there. Oh, my gosh. That was, that's, that's, that's phenomenal. Jeff, this episode went a lot shorter than I thought it would. Same. I thought this we have a long episode. We haven't called our over-unders for like two weeks. And on this one, I was thinking about it. I'm like, I would have probably put it at about 90 minutes. I was just, I was thinking an hour and 35. Yeah. You know, maybe a little longer. Maybe an hour and 45 once we hit. Uh, club 65 speaking of which what's up club 65 yes no um you know this is where i'm tempted to like hey we got all this extra time let's make it an extra long club 65 but i won't i won't dude i 
a couple of weeks ago, you're like, I'm, I got to go and watch this next episode. I have been dying for this next Me episode too. since the end of the shadow of Orlon war. It's like, yeah. um, I have two notes that I didn't get to. Can I, can I share them mm. with you here? Yeah. Uh, so Lita, Lita looked far more like episode one Lita than she did in this new, new, uh, Vorlon, Vorlonized Lita. Because mm. like yeah. I remember seeing her in the first episode, and I when we saw her when she came back and she had like that short bob haircut, yeah, like, she looks younger, she looks fresher, she looks, frankly, she looks prettier than what I remember from episode one, and then in this one she like she had the hair done up again and the the which is her hair long enough to do that? Was she wearing a wig? I, I don't know that her hair is long enough to do that, but whatever. But I was I was kind of going, oh, I get it. It's professional Lita. Okay. Professional Lita right. just looks older and and way less interview fun. going out on interviews, sure, Lita. Sure, way yeah. way less fun. So, uh, you, so you really think Lita and and Zach are are doing it, huh? I, I do, dude. It's Zach. Yes, <laughs> it's a hickey from <laughs> Kanicki, huh? Right. It's like, oh my god. Uh, do you think she? Uh, do you think she's like, I got a bun in the oven? What? Yeah, I'll make an honest woman of you. An honest woman of you, right? <laughs> Jeff, I did have a, a question for you. That yeah. I was going to ask, but the conversation just moved on and I didn't, it, it, we moved on past it and didn't want to come back to it, but, um, great leadership moment asking, would you do what you're asking your subservience to do the whole thing? Would you come in the light and sacrifice yourself? I hated the reason that Delenn gave that because you are that committed to your cast. I was like, eh, don't be committed to your cast, be committed to, you know, well, I think, I think that's, uh, I hesitate to even go down the leadership path with it. You know I mean? The leadership question is what do you sacrifice for your team? Well, I was thinking, you know, is it, would you do what you're asking them to do? Cause if you're asking your castmates, your cast members to go, uh, sacrifice themselves for you, would you also be willing to sacrifice yourself for them? Yeah, which I, honestly, I think we had a better look at that last week with Naroon hiding behind the warrior cast and Delenn walking out in the middle of everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the right thing to do, right? You put yourself, you put your as a leader, you put yourself out there in harm's way. But I think to me, this is almost it's almost more of a question of like, gosh, this is going to sound insensitive, but the uh, the ignorance of ancient tradition. Well, we have this ancient tradition where. For the love of our cast, we go in and die for it. Yeah, we've kind of moved beyond that now. We have like better reasoning for it. Like, in in a way, like now that I think about it, and our talk about thinking they should have, you know, destroyed the cast. Delenn's whole reasoning was we have to double down on our casts. Yeah. It's even more so. And yeah, I don't think that's the right call. But again, I don't know their society that well. Right. Right. So. I thought another leadership moment though, oh. in the uh, I think it was in the open when like Sheridan's sitting in the dark and he he's holding his little risk his little hand communicator and he's like, "Hey, any messages from Delenn yet?" Mm -hmm. Like nothing. But then dude is like, "Hey, I'm sure I'm sure Delenn's okay, sir." And he just ends the call. Ah, oh, missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. Sheridan's just been like, "Hey, thanks for that, crewman. What's your name?" Oh, yeah, thanks for that, crewman. So and so. Boom! Would have made that guy's day. Yep, yep. And I, my note here is like, man, he's worried about his girl. Mm -hmm. Worried about his girl, and he should be. He should be. Yeah. So, all right, Jeff. Well, you mentioned you are excited to go see this next episode. I also am excited to go see this next episode, and I've got some more gifts I have to wrap. So, oh uh, yeah. Shoot, am I going to watch the episode? Or am I going to go for rap gifts? Can I do a Brent watches easier. video while wrapping gifts? I probably could. No, why not? <laughs> right. As I'm watching the episode, people already yell at me enough for taking notes sometimes when I miss stuff. Like if I'm sitting there, you know, folding a Barbie or whatever. Well, and here's the thing people, okay. People have had critical uh, comments for both of our reaction videos, and that's fine. That's great. We welcome, we welcome the, the, the talks. It's great. We welcome the feedback's good. Mine, just so you know. I'm just, I'm just, yeah. Go ahead. What? No, 
Because here's the thing, like people are like, oh, I like when Brent does this thing and does this. I'm like, cool. Hey, did you know that Brent and I, like we have different brains and we process things differently and you're literally watching that happen in real time. So I love that you love the way Brent talks through that thing. That's not the way my brain works. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to performatively do that. Right. For you, people are just like, you missed so much. You took all these notes. Yeah. And also I tend to watch it again. <laughs> Like this, like you don't walk into this conversation most times having just done that. So it's cool. Also, here's the other thing you edit yours. And so when you edit yours, you're getting, like you're watching parts of that episode time and time and time and time again. Trust me, everybody. He's picking up, he's picking up the details. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, it's Jeff. Fine. Thank yeah. You. That's that it, it honestly, Jeff. It it is one of the most annoying, I, and it's nothing more than annoying. But it is truly one of just the most annoying things when people just say that I don't pay attention, and that I don't pick up on stuff. You know what I mean? Like, you're you're literally watching me see this episode for the very first time. You're yeah. what you <laughs> to your point. What you're not watching is the two hours I spend just editing the video watching it again in minute detail also that one other time i may watch it just before we come into the show you know and i pick up on different things than jeff does mm -hmm. who picks up on different things than somebody who's watched the show three four five times does like that's where the magic of the show comes in is we're not this it, it'd be really boring jeff if you and i walked in here with the same notes every single week yeah It'd be awful. People would not, I, I wouldn't like that show. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to put off wrapping and I'm going to watch this next episode and I'm going to do it like, right I, now. one, we have it easier. Just the one kid Two, we were done. I don't know, two, three weeks ago. Oh. Like, yeah. So here's the thing. So typically what happens for me is round about August or September is where like I start I'm walking through a store. I'm like, oh, so and so kid will like that. Let's grab that. And I go stick it in a closet. And what winds up happening is by the time I get to Christmas, like when I pull it all out and look at it, I'm like, oh crap. This is way too much. What have I? And then there's already the stuff that like I've wrapped in is like been under the tree for a couple of weeks, you know? Um, but I'm like, oh crap. This is I like, and then I'm like taking stuff out. Well, I'm gonna have to save that for a birthday. I'm gonna have to, this is going to come for new year's. This will be for Valentine's day. This will be for like whatever we give gifts gifts later on. Like I've got to pull this out because this is ridiculous, you know? Um, but it's still, it's still the, the wrapping piece, so, yeah. but you know, what's good is, um, I've noticed this with my oldest is he's getting less and less every year and it's really good. Yeah. It's really okay. And it's really good. Um, because one, the stuff he's getting is way cooler, you know? Um, but it's, it's less, it, it's less about the stuff with him. Mm -hmm. Uh, now my little one is still in that spot where sometimes just the, the avalanche is still really cool. Like it's mostly trinkets. It's nothing. Yeah. You know, very, very little of it is expensive, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but for her, it's the boom. Uh, but she's almost getting past that spot. So. You know, mm -hmm. I'm looking yeah. forward to the small down nature of stuff. We've, we've always focused on not focusing on the stuff. And so for my daughter, and I, I don't know how much longer this is going to last. Like this last year, um, like I remember Easter, the night on the night before Easter, she was just going off and telling me how the Easter bunny is not real. Oh. oh, sorry. If anybody, if anybody, it, Jeff. yep. Eek. Let that one, out. but she's like, it's not real. It's just, you know, whatever. Like, I know it's not real. And, and I've, I'm, I'm wise enough to know that you just, oh, okay. Like, I'm not going to confirm, deny or anything. Just, okay. We got her an Easter basket, right? And we laid it out. And the next morning she comes downstairs, she sees the Easter basket. And all of a sudden the Easter bunny was very real. Oh, yeah. Again. And so we've been dealing with the last uh, about two weeks of, I don't think Santa, I, he can't do this. There's no way Santa could do that. You know, the, starting to logically question the reality. But I tell you what, that morning she's going to come down and be like, oh, Santa's so real. But the way we've done it, Santa brings her one present. Nice. Yeah. That's it. Then yeah. we get her like a couple, grandma, grandpa, stuff like that. So she has a couple 
down there, but Santa brings one. Yeah. And I'll never forget. It was, I think she was five, five or six. I forget, but it, we, I think she was five. Cause it was just coming out of COVID, not out of COVID, but out of the initial, like, you're not going to school. We're doing this. Mm-hmm. And then, so we got her this cheap little, uh, Chromebook thing. So she could play some games and kind of have her own, own little thing. Cause she, we, we weren't sure if she was going to be home, you know, what that was all going to look like. And she, we're like, Oh, she's going to be excited. She opened it and she was just like, Oh, computer i told santa that i wanted a broomstick (laughs) and we're just like oh no so we have this really great friend in town who we only see so often and so we're like yeah we blew it so we set up to go to coffee and he brought like she wanted like a witch's broomstick toy kind of thing Mm -hmm. so he got one and he brought it and she's like how did you know i wanted a broomstick and he says well on christmas morning i had a note from santa that said that she wants a broomstick, Yeah, bring her a broomstick. And so I was like, see, so, and so he's like, sometimes Santa works through other people. And I'm like, yeah. So we, we kind of played it that oh, way and she was very happy about it. So a couple of years ago, the Polar Express came from my oldest. Oh, I remember you saw, tell me about this. The, yeah. the, the whole idea of the Polar Express is it comes at a moment of crisis, the moment of whatever. I thought that was going to happen this year with my youngest. Cause she's in that spot as well. Like where she's kind of the logic is starting, is starting to hit. Now, listen, for, for those of you out there who don't know me, I will tell you this. I believe in Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a hundred percent real. And you know how I know Santa Claus is a hundred percent real because I am Santa Claus. When my kids ask me, daddy, do you know, Santa? daddy, have you ever met Santa? Yep. Sure have daddy. Do you have Santa's phone number? Yep. Sure do. Daddy, when was the last time you talked to Santa? Not too long ago <laughs> because it's me. And, and it's really the whole idea that, that, uh, Santa is the Christmas spirit, right? The idea that you can give without needing the recognition that you are the gift giver. Right. I know some people are like, ah, oh, screw that. I paid for those presents. I'm going to get all the credit for it. That is anti Santa to me. Yeah. If that, if, if that's you not judging to me, that is anti Christmas spirit. And the idea that we can be generous to give without the need of recognition coming back, we give just because we love. That's it. Yeah. And that as kids, we, we, for kids, we put that into a person of Santa to help them understand that idea. But what it really is, is Santa, Santa is here. Every parent who's up on Christmas Eve wrapping presents for their kids, that is Santa, you know, um, but she did ask this question this year was how come we always get so many Amazon boxes? <laughs> <laughs> like what's, what's going And like, because it, truthfully, a lot of the presents are wrapped in the Amazon box that they came in. <laughs> yeah. And because that's the best, like they're not easily wrappable gifts otherwise. Um, and my son, God bless him looked at her playing a video game didn't even look up from the video game he's like well geez you didn't think that santa actually brought all those gifts at the same time he sent them ahead of time <laughs> like bingo and then, then he goes that's why the writing looks like dads all the time because he wrapped them for them <laughs> but but then he goes but they sent them <laughs> santa sent it ahead that's of good time. i was like that's real good and she, and she was like Oh, okay. <laughs> I was looking at him like you little, right. You know, but he's done so well with the whole thing. Um, you know what he does? He goes and finds every year, uh, it, because he now is a Santa Claus and he mm-hmm. goes and he finds, um, uh, angel tree children, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, that program, uh, he goes and finds them and he he'll pick this year. He picked six kids off an angel tree. Wow. Six. And he, he saved up his own money to go buy gifts for those six kids to be able to, and I'm just, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'm so proud of him, you know? And, and obviously I covered the shortfall because he was not anywhere near close to what he actually needed. Right. But I was just, it's very generous of you. You should have grabbed one. (laughs) Right. Well, no, I'm not going to limit him on that. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'll help him out. Now, if he wants to get the whole damn tree, we're going to have to have that conversation. (laughs) You know, I was like, this is. 
this is really cool. The one thing I wish I could find, and I haven't found one in my area, I would love to take him to like a soup kitchen or something like that where he can serve. Yeah. You know, and he he would love it. It's it's just it's right in his wheelhouse of stuff. This is a kid, by the way, that keeps a um in in every car that we own, both of them. <laughs> too uh he keeps a little bag that has a bottle of water has a candy bar um has a crossword puzzle book and a pen okay right has a toothbrush some toothpaste some hand sanitizer um and usually like some gum or mints or something like that and if he sees a homeless person on the side of the street he will take that bag and give that to that person that's great sometimes if it's like shampoo in it and different stuff like that so like it just hey here's here's some stuff you might need and he yeah. he keeps it like he does it i never go like i'm selfish and old and grumpy <laughs> you know i'm like no nah, don't go over there oh okay yeah go ahead <laughs> so jeff love that i want to go watch the episode let's do it i'm gonna have to i'm gonna i'm gonna stop this i'm gonna turn around and turn it right back on <laughs> cool happy holidays everybody thank, thank you, you so much yeah thank you guys so much um what is next is kwanzaa still going on I'm not sure where the Hanukkah's date. dropped up. I think Kwanzaa happens between Christmas and New Year. I believe I could be so. wrong. Uh, so happy, uh, happy Kwanzaa, uh, happy, whatever other holidays are out there. Happy new year coming up and uh, we'll see you guys next week.